In today's world, a lot of focus and attention is on new emerging technologies, cloud, SDN, virtualization. But lest we forget that all of these need to run on something physical at the end of the day. And this is where we apply a lot of our energy and focus to innovate these foundational technologies to hopefully optimize the experience that customers will get when they run those new technologies. Today we have four updates talking about new innovations in our product and technology portfolio. We're going to start off with Jeff, who's going to talk about some new exciting enhancements to our Nexus portfolio as, as, uh, as far as it pertains to automation. Uh, next, we're going to have Jagbeer talking about a new software uh, operating system that we're going to be bringing out, and it's going to drive much of the innovation in our enterprise switching portfolio moving forward. Lucas is going to talk about some enhancements to our programmable fabric capability with regards to VXLAN. And last but not least, we're going to have Himanshu on talking about a brand new market that we're entering, uh, where we're going to be supporting things like LED lighting powered by Cisco switching, of course. Before we start, I'd like to just leave you with a thought. Internally in Cisco, uh, we have a team motto. Everything runs on switching. And it really is there to drive the importance of the, that foundational technology, because just like plumbing in a house, it might not necessarily be something that you think about, but if it doesn't work right, you sure as heck will know about it. Okay. With that being said, I'm going to hand you over to Jeff, who's going to start the conversation off talking about some of those new automation capabilities with our Nexus platform. Over to you, Jeff. All right, and hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Jeff McLaughlin, and I'm a principal TME here at Cisco in enterprise and data center switching. And I'm going to be talking to you today about automating Nexus switches, and specifically automating them with configuration management tools. Um, I think we're all probably somewhat familiar with configuration management tools like Chef and Ansible, right? I think everybody's probably heard of them at least. Um, but I think that um, when it comes to automating, they're really a great way for people to start automating their network because you know, we hear a lot about um, how, say, you know, people should learn Python because Python's a very easy language to learn. And you know it is if you know C++ or, or you know Java, but if you're a network guy and you've never programmed before, you're not a coder, it's actually pretty hard to learn. There's a pretty steep learning curve. But the configuration management tools are um, fairly easy for someone to learn. I think within a weekend of devoted effort, you could actually be doing some pretty cool things with your network and these tools. And so we're glad to be um, supporting them across the Nexus platform. And for those of you who aren't too familiar with them, the basic idea, they've been in use uh, in the server world for a while. The big tools are Puppet, Chef, and Ansible, and Salt Stack and CF Engine. And basically, um, the way it works is if uh, in the server world, if someone's bringing up a server and they want to make sure that certain packages are installed on that server, right, and that certain libraries are there that are certain versions or certain configuration files are present, or they want to make sure that um, particular services are running on that server, they use these tools to automate that process. So um, as of 7.3 on the Nexus 5, 6, and 7K, um, we support Ansible, Puppet, and Chef across all the Nexus platforms. Okay, so currently, as of, and 7.3 is going to be out at the end of this month. So currently um, on the 3K and 9K switches, we do support um, Puppet, Chef, and Ansible. But as of the end of this month, on the 5, 6, and 7K, we will support them all. Currently, the 5, 6, and 7K only support uh, Ansible in the 7.2 release. And the reason for that is that um, unlike Puppet and Chef, Ansible is an agent-less configuration management tool. So for Puppet and Chef, you have to actually install an agent. So that means that we have to build the agent. And not only that, we have to have the infrastructure to install the agent, right? You need to have um, you need to have a Linux shell running. And so we had to get the, um, the Linux container running for the 5, 6, and 7K. Uh, on the 3K and 9K, you can install the agents directly into the Bash shell, uh, which is available, or else into the Guest shell, which is a, um, it's a Linux container. So kind of like Docker Lite, basically, if you're familiar with Docker. On the 5, 6, and 7K in the new release, um, you'll only be able to install those agents into the, um, into the uh, Linux uh, container, which is called an OAC, or Open Agent Container, on the 5, 6, and 7K. So bottom line is that as of this new release at the end of this month, uh, we'll be supporting them across all platforms. So 
For the purposes of this talk, you know, uh, in the interest of time, I thought I would take one and focus on it and give you a quick overview, and then I'm going to do a live demo. So uh, we'll switch to that, uh, get away from the slides in a minute. So I'm going to talk about Puppet. Um, we were actually up at Puppet Conf back in um, September of last year, and there was a lot of interest um, from the people who were there. A lot of them were server guys, and they're saying, you know, how do we get our network guys interested in this? It's great that you guys can do this, that you can run it on Nexus, but you know, how do we get them interested? And usually my, the, the response that I have is, look, you, you, know, you have to show them the benefit that it, that it has for them. I mean, we hear a lot about CLI being error prone or difficult to, it's not repeatable or those sorts of things. But at the end of the day, um, if for most network guys, if they take a stack of switches and you tell them, you know, we need you, I need you to configure the stack of switches, they're probably going to configure the first one, take the config, put it in a notepad, and then change a few things and paste it into all the other switches, right? And that's automating, right? That, that's a kind of automation. Notepad is like an automation tool for a lot of people. So this is, like I said, with a fairly small investment of time, I think there's a very big return for people who would, um, who would do that sort of thing. So a basic, um, basically how Puppet works and the other tools are very similar. There's a central server, in the case of Puppet, it's called the Puppet Master. And on that server lives the configuration files that you'll be pushing out to the devices that you're managing. Again, with Puppet, um, there's an agent, um, whether it's compute nodes or uh, one of our switches. And in order for Puppet or any of these tools to configure something, they have to, of course, know what it is that they're configuring, right? They have to know the parameters um, about, about what they're actually um, uh, configuring on that device. And so in the case of Puppet, um, it gets that information from uh, their repository, which is called the Puppet Forge. Okay, so the Puppet Forge is where they store all of those resources, they're called providers and types, that are needed to configure devices. And so if you want to um, configure a Cisco device using Puppet, you would go on your Puppet Master and type, you know, Puppet module install, and you would give it the name of our module, which is Cisco Puppet. And then your server would go and pull that down from the forge and install it, and you would be able to configure our devices. Now, you also have the option, there are some resources living in GitHub. I think we're all familiar with GitHub by now, probably. Maybe if I asked that question a year ago, a lot of network engineers might not be able to answer it, but I think people know now that it's a source code repository, um, an open source code repository. Um, so what happens is Cisco <coughs> Puppet Labs, our customers, the open source community, can contribute resources to GitHub. And then Cisco and Puppet Labs go through a qualification process and over time pull those resources into the forge. So anything that's living here in the forge would be um, approved, you know, the code meets certain standards. It's um, supported, which means that you know, if you pick up the phone and call Puppet, they will you know, obviously feel the call on that if you're paying for a support contract and you have the enterprise version. And um, yet if you want to um, take advantage of some of the more kind of bleeding edge stuff that's available, that would be living in GitHub. It's not yet necessarily approved. It may work. It may work very well, but it's just not brought into the forge yet. So you have that option too. So if you look at actually what's in the forge now, um, you know, there's, we support what's called NetDev Standard Library, which is basically some vendor independent uh, modules. And then we also support some basic config like AAA and SNMP, um, IP interface config, VLAN config, protocols, VRFs, and, um, and then if you look in, the, in uh, GitHub, you'll see some other modules like VXLAN, for example. That's not in the forge yet, but it should be there soon. Any questions before I go to the next slide? Okay. So some of the use cases that we have for Puppet. So day zero, there's kind of a chicken and the egg thing, right? Like, how do I configure the switch with this um, tool if I don't have it installed yet? You know, in the case of Puppet and Chef, we need an agent. So if you're rolling out a data center with hundreds of switches, day zero, what you're gonna do is use power on auto provisioning, which is like our zero touch provisioning um, system to bring that switch up. So with power on auto provisioning, the switch comes up, it gets a DHCP address. That DHCP address in the options field points it to a TFTP server, and then it pulls down a script that it executes, and that script um, does some initial basic configuration of the box. In the case of Ansible, for example, really what you need is um, 
you need a management IP address and NX API turned on, and that's pretty much all you need. In the case of Puppet and Chef, there's a little bit of additional configuration because you have to get the shell up and running, and then you have to get the agent installed, and there's a little bit of configuration that has to take place. But after the power on auto provision process is complete, you can hand off to the configuration management tool and it can manage your switch for you after that. Um, after that, you know, again, you could configure interfaces, VLANs, routing protocols, those sorts of things. Um, and then ongoing, we can do uh, installation now of packages, third party packages. So um, for example, I think they have um, RPMs available for um, some monitoring tools like Splunk and Ganglia, and there's a T-Collector agent available. You could install those in the shell by hand using like a yum <coughs> install like you would on any you know, Red Hat or CentOS box. Um, or you could use a configuration management tool to automate that process. And then we can also do patching, um, and I'll do a demo of that uh, in just a minute. Um, patching would be, you know, if you have a BGP update that needs to go out to your, um, oh, I shouldn't say a BGP update, not like a BGP update, packet, but an update to the BGP software on your switches, and you need to push that out. Um, you could, of course, do that manually, or you could use an automation tool like Puppet to push that out. So I'm going to um, switch to the demo. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the topology and then run the live demo for you. Um, but I'll just uh, pause one more time and see if there are any questions before I go on to it. Where do you it, recommend running the agent from? I don't know if you can do you know, the bash shell, a guest shell, and... So on the 3K, 9K, you could do either. Um, and, I, you know, there's not really a recommendation. It, it depends on, you know, however you want to run it, whatever your preference is. The, the 5, 6, and 7K, you're going to do it in the container um, because that's the only way to run it. Um, is that the equivalent of the guest shell in the 9K? It's, yeah, it's a very similar concept. And I'll show you the CLI for that in a second. Cool. Yeah. Is, so, the, is the NX API feature on the 3K, 9K the same as on the 6K and other platforms? Yes. It's identical? Yeah. Okay. And that's, by the way, when, when you're using, if you go to Jason's um, GitHub page and you get the NXOS Ansible modules and you install them on your Ansible server and that server provisions your switches, it's talking NX API. So that's ac actually, there's nothing Ansible specific on the box when you're using Ansible mm -hmm. to provision it. So Jason's modules in that case, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're kind of like a translator between Ansible and NX API, sure, essentially. Sure. So the demo I'm going to run for you, it's a pretty simple topology. There are three boxes. In this case, they're all 7Ks. Um, and one I'm calling a spine switch, but really the difference between the spine and the leaf switches is the spine has two interfaces. Um, and so what I'm going to do, I'm going to, um, using the Puppet Master server, I'm going to um, provision some VLANs, configure those VLANs with um, a name, an SVI with an IP address, and bring up OSPF. So when it's done, we should have OSPF adjacencies between all of these. And then I'm not showing it here, but I have a 9K also, and I'm going to push a patch to it using the Puppet Agent. Okay. All right, so let me get started. I'm actually going to pull up a chair so I don't have to hunch over. Get to the terminal window and make sure it's big enough for all of you to see. I'm not blocking you guys too much. Let me just bring that up a bit. So um, I have several tabs open here. Can you guys read this? Okay, great. So the first switch I have is a leaf switch. And what I'm doing on this switch, normally the way, if you're running Puppet, the way you would run it is you'd have the agent running as a service on the box. And what happens is every 30 minutes by default, that agent checks in with the Puppet Master and it pulls down the configuration for that switch, okay? So that's normally how you'd run it, but I didn't want to do that on the other switches because for a demo, you want, you want to see it run, and I don't want it running in the background. But for the first switch, I did leave it running um, as a service in the background. So on this switch, if I do a show VLAN brief, I can see that those VLANs are configured. If I do a show IP interface brief, I can see the SVIs are there. They're not up yet because the rest of the switches aren't configured. I can do a show IP OSPF neighbor. There are no neighbors, um, but it takes the command, and you'll see that on the other switches it won't take the command. Um, now, if I do, there's a new um, CLI for the 5, 6, and 7K in 7.3. Um, it's called, it's the virtual service CLI. So if I say show virtual service list, you can see running here the Linux container, okay? 
And so I'm not going to go through the installation for you because it takes a few minutes in the interest of time. But basically the way it works is you would say virtual service install. You would give it a name like OAC2. And you point it at a package, which typically would be on boot flash. So in this case, we distribute a file, which is called, it's an OVA file. And that file is the um, container um, software. So you would just run this command, and it would install it. And then uh, there's one other command that you have to add in the running config. You just have to activate it, virtual service OAC activate. And that's it. Once you've done that, the container is up. You may have to do some additional configuration because it is a Linux container for like DNS or that sort of thing. But this brings up the container for you. And so we can connect to that container, virtual service connect, name OAC console. So we're basically connecting to its virtual console port. And this is a, you know, a Linux box just like any other. We can do a uname or look in the Etsy directory, right? And on this box, ps-ef. We, Can I ask you to pretend that I'm about 70 and just zoom in a little bit? Yeah, sure, sure. I'm sorry. Let's see. Thank you. Probably, is that a little probably, bit better? Is it possible to sit over there? Yeah, yeah, sure. Let me yeah, see. I just sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. I don't want to uh, disconnect all of these. Uh, I'm yeah. wired up here. Let's Perfect. see. Is Thank that you. a little bit better? Awesome. Okay, great. So I'm going to do a PS here, and uh, you can see that Puppet is running as a service here. Okay. So again, every 30 minutes by default, um, I actually have it set to 10 minutes just to make sure it actually ran here. Um, that uh, agent will run and check its config. Um, on this box, which is really small, so let me blow that up a bit for you. Um, this box does not have the agent running, so there's no VLANs configured. Um, there are no IP interfaces. If I do show IP OSPF neighbor, it doesn't even work because the feature is not enabled yet. So on Nexus box, you can't do it if the feature is not enabled. And the same on this one. Let me make it a little bigger for you. Um, show uh, VLAN brief. Show IP interface brief. OK, so this is the same. So I'm going to start uh, the agent running on these guys. Um, so I'm going to run it on this one, even though we know it already ran. This is the first one. And then I'm going to run it on the other ones. So I'll just make my life a little easier and copy that. So we'll start it running there. I'm going to come back to it. Don't worry. Let's see. Console. Uh, sorry, connect. Puppet agent, we're running it there. And virtual service connect. And we're running it there. And while those are running, I'm going to show you the 9K, and I will show you um, the output from that in just a second. Okay, here's our 9K. If I do um, show install patches, okay. So that's the syntax on the 3K, 9K if you want to install a patch. Um, like, like I said, like a patch to the BGP software. There's nothing installed right now. Okay. Uh, I also have guest shell open on that. So let me just bump these up. Okay, so guest shell's running again. Puppet agent is not running on that one. So while those are running, uh, I'm just going to show you um, what the manifests look like in Puppet so you can see what we're actually pushing. And then I'll go back and show you the results. This isn't the only way to do it. In fact, with this small number of, of switches, I could probably put all of this in one file, but I'm just doing this to show you how the, um, the different, uh, the hierarchy of the files works. So in this case, I've categorized the different switches um, into different um, blocks of code here. In the first one, so with, um, with Puppet, anything that has a dollar sign before it is a variable, okay? So for each of these, I'm defining the last octet of the IP address that's going to be assigned. So I'm using a slash 24 with the same first three octets, only changing the last one. I define the interface that's facing the, um, the core or the spine on the leaves. And then again, the spine just has two interfaces, so I have a slightly different block of code for it. And then I'm categorizing those into roles by using these include statements. Okay, so these guys are leaves, this guy's a spine, and this one I'm only doing the patch, so I just put the, the, the patch class there. Um, if you look here and follow the arrow, you can see that um, I showed you the leaf um, class right here. So basically, it's doing something pretty simple. It's just unshutting that interface, making it a trunk port, throwing a description on it. And then that includes another file, dcvlan. I'll show you that file. I'm not going to go through this line by line, but the basic idea is it pulls some data out of another file, yet another file, and it teases some information out of it. And it uses that, um, the variables that it gets out of that file to configure a VLAN, 
an SVI and a setup, a separate OSPF process for each VLAN. And it also provisions a single loopback interface that's going to be shared for all those OSPF processes. And the file that that's coming <coughs> from right here is VLAN data file. That just um, defines the VLAN number, name, IP address. And notice I'm using that last octet variable there. So in the case of Puppet, if you use double quotes and you put the variable in, it will, it will replace that with the variable for the particular host that it's configuring. Uh, and then I've got process IDs and area on there. So let's go back to our demo, and we should see the switches configured now. So the resolution switches a little bit, so I'll try to make that big for you. Okay, so on the first switch, you'll notice one of the things about these tools, they generally don't change something unless it needs to be changed. So the first thing they do is to look at the config, see what's there, and then make a decision as to what needs to be changed. So uh, on this switch, the first thing it does is pull the configuration down, and there are some warning messages. These aren't errors, they're just warnings, saying that it's unable to get MTU for some virtual interfaces. Um, and then you'll see down here that it says it's applying the configuration, um, but then it doesn't really do anything. It's not saying what it's doing. This, that's because on this switch, we already had the agent running in the background. In the second case, right here, you can see that we had those same messages, but now you can see that it actually did a lot of things. So it provisioned the interface, um, the core facing interface. It provisioned the VLANs, the SVIs, and the OSPF processes um, for all of those VLANs. And the same thing on the uh, spine switch, which is right here. So now on those switches, if I get out of my um, container and go back to the Nexus CLI and do show VLAN brief, we can see that there are VLANs configured that weren't there before. If I do show IP interface brief, we can see the SVIs and show IP OSPF neighbor. We can actually see um, all of the neighbors came up. It has two neighbors on every VLAN in this case. And on the first one where it didn't do anything, we remember, you can remember that there weren't any uh, OSPF neighbors at first, but now it has adjacencies on all the VLANs. Now on the 9K where we had no patches, we're gonna run the agent, and it won't take very long to run that. And what this is gonna do, so we have a, a sample patch file, and the patch again is just an uh, RPM. It's not liking my environment variables, but I think it's running anyways. Live demos always work, always. <laughs> so what it's gonna do is pull down the RPM uh, patch file, sample patch file, copy that to boot flash and install it. So I didn't get those warnings the last time I ran it, but anyways, it looks like it did pull down the file and it did uh, install it. And we will see if that's the case here, show install patches. Yeah, so we can now see that the patch has been installed. So you can do that install from the command line, um, or if, again, if you have to push that out to a lot of switches, you could use the configuration management tool to push it out. Okay. So a lot of these, the stuff that's happening here, it's already done for you. It just has to come from, from Puppet Forge. And then you've got to edit a file to give it whatever values. Yeah. It could eventually, it could be <clears throat> web-based Right, fill in the values, and then behind the scenes, it does it all for you. Yeah, there's a, there's a few options, and the demo that I ran is pretty simple. Um, one thing that's great about these tools is they have a lot more programmatic control um, over the things that they're configuring. So you can run loops and iterate through variables and things. So, you know, in this case, I kind of manually defined all of the VLANs, but you could have some kind of an iteration if you wanted to. Um, Yes, you could potentially, you know, have some sort of a web-based configuration that builds the manifests. Um, the manifests themselves, you build. Um, so, you know, you can obviously get sample files for whatever configuration management tool you're running and base your work off of those. But what comes from the forge is really um, the resources that tell Puppet what and how to configure, not, not actually... Uh, well, it really tells it how to configure, and telling it what to configure yeah. is the role of the manifest that you define. Okay, okay so <clears throat> in terms of, of going back and doing things over again, um, I'd like to have a switch that I could drop in and get cabled up, and my manifest simply says, apply these IP addresses on it. It needs to be trunking, um, but then I want to be able to dynamically create 
on it to, to dynamically figure out which physical interfaces it was, who the upstream neighbor is that it really got plugged into, because maybe somebody plugged it into the wrong upstream. Yep. Okay, so I want to be able to, to determine that, and I want to be able to create the description dynamically, because I want to add tags to it that allow me to better manage that device. Yep. Um, possible. <laughs> some of that is possible. I know that we can do, you know, like um, cable plan verification. Excuse me while that thing goes dark. Um, I don't know if we can do it exactly the way you described it. You know, one thing is that, you know, this is still pretty new. I mean, it's just coming out across 5, 6, and 7K. So uh, as, as, um, as we continue with this, I think the features will get more robust. Um, but again, I, I think that we can do cable plan verification. With that. <coughs> so um, I can actually, uh, I've done a little bit of this on the 9K only, so I can't speak to the whole, how this extends to the 5K, 7K, but, um, and it won't be just using one tool. Um, in my experience, you do have to augment this with a little bit of your own software mm -hmm. um, because, for instance, you can query the switches LLDP or CDP tables. That's what I was thinking, yeah. And make those calculations yourself. And then absolutely, you could use tools like this to push the relevant config down. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, what I, the one thing that I did, uh, this is almost a year and a half ago, I think, um, was uh, host my own Apache server. Mm -hmm. and, and when I received a query from when the switch, when it booted up, based off of those parameters, um, I would get the LLDP information and I could push the right config down um, mm -hmm. from that because it could download uh, configs from that, from that web server. And so, you, so it's all possible. It's just, it's, I don't think there's really a, a one solution to, to do that whole thing. Small matter of programming. Yeah, no, and I, and I think, this, I think this, 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 um, this really speaks to the, the real benefit of, of automation, and that is mm -hmm. it places more control into the hands of the customer um, yeah. to define their own destiny. And, and, I, and I think it's great that vendors provide the tools, and of course they can, they can build all their own software on top of that to, to do the turnkey thing, but for those that kind of want to fill in the blanks, I think this is right, the right direction. And what you've said too, I've done things like that with Ansible in terms of gathering neighbor data and use that data to configure descriptions on interfaces, let's say. Right. So it's step one, query it, and again, I'm not as adverse in Puppet, but in other tools you can definitely do that as long as you build the logic in yourself for the querying part of it, it's not natively built in. Yeah, because I'd like to add tags to the descriptions on interfaces right, right, because right. that allows me to, to then do device grouping and interface grouping for management. You know, okay, is this a critical interface that went down or just an edge interface? Yeah, right. Let's, or is it a critical edge interface? Yeah. Oh, exactly. <laughs> so the scripting, um, you have the ability to script these things on top of OpenNX OS, what we brought out with the uh, previous release on the Nexus 9000. We're going in the same direction on the 7,500 6, towards, I guess it's summer end of this year. Uh, which provides the same open NX OS capability. Um, there is also a free available PDF kind of, call it a book, which, which has some of these use cases in there. So uh, we can share the link after that, uh, give it along to you guys. You can look a little bit what you can do with open NX OS, what possibilities you have. I, okay. I, I did have one question actually. Uh, in my experience on the 9Ks, I believe it was, the, the, the power and access provisioning feature mm -hmm. allows you to, at boot time, download a Python script. Yes. And then have that run locally. Is this also extended here? That's how I did what I was just describing. Yeah, you can do that with 5.6.7K as Excellent. well. Um, cool. That's, that's a very normal tool. way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it downloads that script um, as part. Of, it gets um, the, the TFTP server address from the DHCP <laughs> options and then downloads um, right. the script from there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And you can get those. We have scripts available on CCO if you, need to, if you want to play with that as well. Okay. So thank you very much. Any more questions? I have one question. Uh, what I have uh, seen here um, would also be possible with Ansible without a client, yeah? Yes. On the platform. Just for me, I know it's more religious uh, question, but um, <laughs> why do you have decided as a Cisco to push the Puppet client to your, uh, let's say, switches? Yeah? Right. So, I mean, we, we are supporting all three. Um, okay. And... You know, I, I just, you know, I had to pick one in the interest of time. I couldn't demo all three. Um, so if, if you want to use Ansible, you can. Um, the, I think that oftentimes in an enterprise, one of these tools is already in place. And so you're trying to fit into workflows that maybe are already defined. I mean, maybe the server guys want to bring up a server and have a, you know, VLAN configured on interface or something like that. 
So oftentimes you're probably going to go with what's already in place in your enterprise. So if you're a Puppet enterprise and you want to start using one of these tools, you'll go with Puppet. If you're a Chef enterprise, you'll go with Chef. Okay, so behind that, you will support all three mentioned platforms in the long term, yeah? Yes. That is uh, Cisco strategy, yeah? Yep. Okay. What's the level of support in Puppet for the configuration commands? Like, what, what can you configure right now using Puppet? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, as I said, you know, it's still, it's still pretty new. Um, if you go into the Forge, you know, the, the commands are still pretty basic. I mean, you can do, I think I mentioned NetDev standard library, and then, um, you know, AAA, SNMP interfaces, VLANs, protocols, I think OSPF, BGP, VRFs, OSPF and BGP in the VRFs. Um, and then if you go into GitHub, there's quite a few more resources available. Um, I think I mentioned VXLAN. I, I don't know all of them off the top of my head, um, but there are several more in GitHub. And you know, as time goes on, those are getting pulled in um, to the forge. Um, so for the purposes of clarity, if we configure the device initially using Puppet, and then we make changes via CLI, and the Puppet manifest gets checked again in 10 minutes, and things are not the way the manifest expected to be, it is presumably going to change them back the way it thought it should be, right? Yes. Okay. So there's an, there's an implication here that once you're committed, or at least in theory, once you've started doing it with Puppet, you're kind of committed to going in that direction and really doing everything that way. And at which point it's kind of a useful way to audit your equipment every 10 minutes. Yes. To make sure nothing changed. On the other hand, it also kind of you know, tips your hand in one direction. Yeah, so in the first place, if you're changing something that Puppet is not, that is not in the manifest, it's probably, it's just going to leave it. Um, if you, you know, if you delete a VLAN that it thinks should be there, it's going to add it back. Um, so yeah, obviously, if you're doing stuff via CLI, you want to make sure to go back to the manifests. You, you'd probably, if you had to do CLI config on a box, you'd probably stop the Puppet service, do your CLI config, go back over the manifest, make sure it's not going to mess anything up, and then start the service again. I saw the, when the interfaces were configured, it would it put a description on there, managed by Puppet. Yeah. Does it do anything with the VLAN names so you'd know, don't mess with these? That's up to you. I mean, I could have added it so that it named the VLAN so something you, you that would be. you added that? I added that, yeah. Okay. That was, that's in that manifest. If I deleted that gotcha. line, I could put it, put whatever I wanted. Yeah. 